sit right here, just depending on what the pastor does. It's fun to be silly. That's for sure. We ought to see my household. I think I'm all reserved in anything. Uh, I'm the biggest goofball there is in my house. Well, who's glad to be here this morning? Amen. Yeah. It is good to be here. Such a beautiful day. Wow, what an opportunity. What an opportunity we have every day. Not just Sundays. Not just in here. We have a new opportunity every time we open our eyes in the morning and say, God, thank you for another day of life. How can I serve you today? Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new beginning. We do that every day. Wow. Start fresh and start anew. And that's because, you know, last week I said that God is in the eternal business. And I got to thinking about the word eternity and how long eternity is. How long is eternity? eternity. It's so long we can't really get our minds around it. It's, a, it's almost abstract. Right? Well, I heard this explanation of how long eternity is, and I'll say this briefly. If you were to, everybody's seen a pinball ball, it's a steel ball. If you were to imagine, just go with me here, imagine a steel ball the size of this world, this earth. And then imagine a little small sparrow that every thousand years, this sparrow is released. And as it brushes by the surface of this steel ball the size of this earth, its wing barely touches it. And eternity is how long it will take for that wing to brush by a steel ball and wear it away to zero. That's a long time. That's a long time. But we don't have a long time in order to secure that eternity. That's very that's in the here and now. Now why God did that that way, I don't know. God's ways are not our ways. But that's how he designed it. So as we prepare our hearts and minds, let's think about that. Time here is short to make 
decisions out of the eternal presence with him. Please pray with me. Well, Lord Jesus, even that analogy of how long eternity really is, is uh, puts into perspective a concept that is really beyond our ability to totally comprehend, and that's okay. We know that it we know that eternity is with you, and that's all that matters. We know that our eternal life is secured here in this temporal existence, which by comparison is so short as to be almost non-existent in comparison, of course, but wow, in that short period of time, all of these decisions are made, and it's a conscious, conscious decision that we each make individually to accept you as who you are, to acknowledge you as who you are, and to trust in who you say you are. And we do that, Lord, by stepping away from ourselves, getting out of the way of ourselves, and allowing you to take command and control of our existence to allow you, through your Holy Spirit, to indwell in us. And until we invite you into our hearts, that Holy Spirit is outside of us. And we are separated. But Lord, when we believe, we profess, we confess, and we receive, Spirit, we are forever changed. Part of that process, whether we are pre-Christian or are currently enjoying the Holy Spirit indwelling us, part of that process is by coming together as a congregation in this place at this point in time. To praise you, to learn more so that we can be changed, certainly for the better, and then to be given the opportunity to go before others and profess who you are. We do that this morning. We acknowledge your grace and mercy over our lives and in all things. We ask your forgiveness of our sins as we continue to need it renewed. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us. Lord Jesus, may this worship hour be pleasing to you. But Lord, we know that you, you don't need our praises. You don't need our worship. You, you are omnipotent. You are all-knowing, all-powerful. There's nothing that we can bring to the table that would give you anything that you don't already have. But our praise and worship really ultimately is for our benefit. Because you want the best for us. And we thank you for that is truly the very essence of the word love and what love is. We honor you and worship you this morning, Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Please stand and join us as we continue in worship together.
we know that God is always with us, but it is so amazing to just feel that tangible presence of the God, of God, his presence. What an amazing morning already. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Janish, my sister, we have been praying for Janish's sister, Nancy, and for her niece as well in India. Uh, she's uh, had COVID. She's been in the hospital, trying to get her into hospital, trying to get her treatments. And, and Janice just wants to have a word with the church this morning. You're wonderful. You're home. <laughs> Hi, um, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you so much for all your prayers for my sister and her family. Um, it's all God's grace that she's home now and she doesn't have any symptoms. And she's really better, um, other than a little bit headache and uh, running nose. Uh, the, it's all, I would say that it's completely God's grace. And you all are stood with me and praying for her and praying for my niece. Thank you so much. Um, the situation in India, you all know, how listen to the um, radio and television. It's really pitiful uh, being a physical therapist, a paramedic. I feel like, um, it's really devastating. There is no medical service for the people. Even my sister, she has not received any auscultation or any other um, support from the doctor. She stayed in one room. Um, my sister's family provided the food and other things. Other than that, medical care was nothing. Thank God she didn't need an oxygen. Um, the hospitals refuses patient admission just because they don't have enough oxygen supply. Please continue to pray for India and my sister's family. Um, poverty and employment and um, financial crunches people have. It's so much. Um, I think it's only God could handle this situation. I don't think anyone else could do it. Please lift them up uh, in your prayer and uh, thank you so much. And my sister also wanted to thank you all for your prayers. And I continue to pray for her and for her family I want her to receive God's salvation. Um, I know I have witnessed God's uh, presence in my life, and I'm happy with whatever the struggle I go through, just like you all, because I know our God is with me, with us. I want her to realize that fact. Uh, that's the only one truth we all know, that she still the, doesn't have it, but I believe that one day, in his time, she will know that truth. Thank you so much. God hears, God cares. And the prayers of a, of a faithful congregation, even lifting up a, 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 young, a young woman in another country. We don't ever have to meet her. We've met the one who cares. Amen. And we pray. That he continues to show us his greatness and his goodness. That he continues to pour himself down on this congregation. That he continues to answer our prayer. That we see people come to him and acknowledge him. Pray with me this morning. Our Father, we thank you for, this, for even being able to step foot in this place this morning. Your presence. Oh, your presence. Thank you, God, that you love and you care and you came and you delivered and that your salvation is for whosoever will. And we just sit in awe of your presence, Father. Thank you. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you, to know you, to, to, to come hard after you. Help us this day, this morning, God, to hear a word from you as we open up scripture and as we feel your presence. Sometimes, Father, we just don't feel your presence. Sometimes it feels like your distance. But you are not. And you tell us you are always with us. And that maybe we just need to always remember that your presence is ours. Your presence is ours for the, for the asking, for the reaching. Christ, we pray. It's a decision we make. It's a decision that we make in order to acknowledge Christ as Lord. It's a decision that we make that, that our God is not going to force us into a relationship with Him. And it is a decision that we make in order to walk with Him.
And it's hard. It's hard to see those that we love, that we care about, and then it's hard to see those around the world that, that may not even have the opportunity like we have right here in the United States to be able to hear a word from God. To be able to simply walk into a church on any given Sunday morning, any Wednesday night, any time that we want to turn on uh, st live streaming, we can hear the word of God. And that is not found in many other places. I, I, Janice, I was listening to you, and I remembered when we lived in Uganda, and we had people that were sick that worked for us, and you had to carry things to the hospital for them there in Uganda. If they wanted to eat, you had to feed them. If they wanted water, you had to, if you wanted to make medications, you had to pay for it. You had to, it's, nothing was, you didn't check them in and go, okay, I'll be back to check on you next week. If you didn't check on them, they may die of starvation, let alone anything else. And so those are some places in the world. I'm not suggesting there where your sister's at, but I'm saying those places are real. And so we, we as, a, as a people here this morning, right now, I would ask you to be thinking about the blessings that you have that have been poured out on you by God, your creator, God, your sustainer, that he, he gives you the opportunity to meet him, to come face to face with him through scripture, through understanding, through comprehension, through the presence of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I remember one time we went to uh, 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 Paris, and uh, we went there uh, not on holiday. We went there to work with uh, Muslims, mostly uh, Moroccans that speak a, a particular language. I think it was Tashlight, and we had these the, the Jesus video. You know the Jesus video we used to give out? Well, we had a bunch of them in that language, Tashlight, and so it was our job to just kind of sit down there and clandestinely give out these Jesus videos, and people would come by, Muslims would come by and go, ah, and they just want to cuss you and holler at you, and then sneak back and, and, what, and get that. Because they wanted to hear the word of God. They were hungry to hear the word of God. But they were having to make decisions in their life. Do I ostracize myself from my family, from my community, from my heritage, from my... Yes, that's what we're all called to do. And decisions mean things. And while we were there, we, were at a, uh, we went to a little restaurant and I don't speak French, far from it. I don't even hardly speak English. And up written on there was uh, something written in, in French. And I asked one of the young ladies that was with us, I said, Nikki, what does that say? She goes, it's hard to see the light of the sun if you will not open your eyes. It's hard to see the light of the sun if you won't open your eyes. And I thought, that is amazing. And that's true. You know, we make decisions day in, day out about how we see the world and, and how we see each other. And, and Today we're going to be in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 45, and I'm going to go through verses 5 through 7. And we're going to talk a little bit about decision making. You know, I've been saying that the next couple of weeks and last week is about prayer. It's really, to me, all this is founded in, in prayer and how we pray and how we reach off up to our Father and how we, how we perceive what He knows or or hears from us. And we, we have to, last week we talked about having confidence that when we approach the throne of God, we can have confidence that he cares about us and that he hears from us. And this morning, I just want you to know that he, that we have to acknowledge him though. We can't approach the God of all creation and expect the God to hear us because he says he will. He said he will, he will be with us and he will, he will hear from us. But also we have to acknowledge who he is. We have to say, God, you are. And he tells us over and over in scripture that when we approach God the Father, not only do we have to have confidence that our prayers are efficacious, that, that there's, they're effective, and that he hears us, but we also need to acknowledge who he is, the God of the universe, who can hear our prayers and actually do something about it. It says here in, in, in chapter 45, verses 5 through 7, now remember, I had a couple kids in my office this morning. They just happened to be coming by and they needed some, their parent needed something. And I said, look what I'm doing. And I was marking up with, with crayons, basically, with markers, my, my, my sheet here. Because this is poetry, okay? This is poetry. And it has, a certain, it has a certain aspect to it that's poetic. Oh, my goodness. I'm sitting here talking about this. And we have a professor that uses the Bible for, for literature in here. And I won't call him out because I didn't ask his permission. But uh, I... Boy, I'm, I better humble myself really quickly. Um, but it's beautiful. And, and the words that we're giving here, giving here, is God's love letter to us. And it's, it's poetic and it's beautiful. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you that you will not, that even though you have not known me. 
and that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is none other besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity, I am the Lord who does all these. So he tells us in these three verses right here, he tells us, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. He repeats that three times at the very beginning as he says that there is none besides him. And at the very end, he says, I am the Lord. We are to acknowledge him. And he wants our acknowledgement of him. He doesn't want to be set aside. He's, he's telling you right there who he is. I am the Lord. And he uses his personal name there, Yahweh. He, he, he says, I'm, I'm the Lord. And, and you, you can love me. And you can know me. And you can care for me. And you can hear my word. And you can respond to my voice. And he's saying exactly who he is. But he's also telling you that there's an exclusivity to him. He says, besides, and with the exception of him, there is no other God. He said, it's not just me among others. That word right there, and of course, again, like I said, it's poetic. And some of these words that we use in English, like besides, and then we use besides again, are actually two different words with two different meanings. He's saying right here, besides, with the exception of him, there is no God. And he wants to make that clear. There's, you can have all sorts of little g-gods in this world. You can, you can put your faith and your trust in so many different things in this world. But he is saying, look... First off, we need to establish something. I am a personal God. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord, your God. And besides me, with the exception of me, there is no other. None. And so I will gird you up. I will belt you. I will bind you. I will encompass you. I will, I will reach out for you. And even though you have not known me, and the word known there is, you know, it's really the, the grasp. Yada is the word. It's, it's to, 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 to deeply ingest and to de perceive me and to know me and to understand me even though you have not fully come to know me and as a Christ follower I think about that all the time as my progression has gone in my maturing in Christ the sanctification process of, of coming to Christ but then coming to know Christ to know God and to know what he wants from me and what he wants from us and that and that day by day walk with him he wants me to perceive him he wants you to understand him he wants you to grasp who he is, but he says, but you not known me. But the reason I am God and there is none other besides me, and I'm going to go ahead and gird you because at least you call out my name. And, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to strengthen you and I'm going to encourage you, even though you really don't know me completely so that others may know me. From the rising of the sun, from the dawning of light to the darkness that comes in the evening. It's beautiful. When you read this in its entirety and you understand it, it's our Father writing to us of his love and his care for us and, and, and his, his exclusivity as God. And it goes on to say, though you've not known me from the rising of the sun. And then he says again, he goes, but there, that there is no one besides me. That's a completely different word. We said besides earlier that he said besides me there is no God. But then he says that there is no one besides me. There is no one that, apart from him. If you are in God, if you are in Christ, if you are in relationship with God, you are. Do you feel that? Do you feel that relationship with God? That when you walk with him and he gives you he gives you perception and understanding and comprehension of who he is. It starts building a foundation for who you are. And he says, apart from me, you're nothing. Besides me, out, outside of me, apart from me, you're, you're nothing. And we have, to, we have to acknowledge that also in our lives. That we, we think that, you know, just because it's a terrible thing to raise children. <laughs> I were one. And, and sometimes we think that everything revolves around us. Sometimes we believe that the world was created for us. And even as adults, if we don't get a little bit of perception and a little bit of self-understanding, uh, and, and, uh, we continue to believe that the world revolves around us. But God's going to be very, very specific here. I am a personal God to you, and I love you, and I care for you. And besides me, there is no God. And besides me, outside of me, life is not even worth living. 
there is nothing outside of him. And then he repeats again, I am the Lord. And there is no other. There's no duplicate. There's no copy. There's no, oh, this is that God, and then there's that other God. He's saying again, there is no other. There is no other. And then as we go into verse 7, which I find absolutely the most fascinating, he tells us who he is. He, he, he tells us there's an exclusivity to him. And then he tells us what he does for us. Here it says, I'm the one forming light and creating darkness. Causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord that does all these things. So he's telling us who he is. And he's telling us he's exclusively, our relationship with him is an exclusive, an exclusive thing. And he's telling us right here what he does. Remember earlier he said, I will gird you. I will arm you. I will prepare you. I'll give you the ability that you need in order to tell people about me. I'll gird you. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap my arms around you. I'll prepare you because I want you to know who I am. Fully, deeply, completely, and I want you to tell folks who I am. And it goes on to say other things. He says, I'm the one forming. I'm the one fashioning light. He's the one that's creating light, fashioning it. To, you know, we talk about God and, and when it comes to light, that some things reflect light. Like these lights are shining down on me and, and I'm reflecting its light. You can see me because I'm reflecting light. But, but that light can be turned off. The reflection can be done away with the the sun is 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 a, is a light if, if the sun goes away it's just, what god is when he says he's light light cannot that of god cannot be extinguished or created he is the light of all times he is the eternal light max was talking about the eternity earlier from from our comprehension god exists God is. It's circular. I mean, he's, it, he doesn't step in at any point in time. He always has been. He always will be. He invites us into a relationship with him. He tells us, what I will, here's what I will do for you. I will, I will gird you. I will, I will create light because it shines. It emanates from me. And he said that, that I, will, I will give you that light, that illumination, that enlightenment, that understanding. He said also, I am creating from nothing. He says, I am creating darkness. That word there is ex nihilo, from nothing. From nothing I will create darkness. Now, get this point. If God is light and in his presence light is, and is God everywhere the way we comprehend everywhere? God is in all places. God is there. But what he says here, I will create from nothing. I will create darkness. I will take an opportunity when I need to in order, you know what this, the, he uses this term here actually for the 10 plagues in a Egypt. He says, I'm going to put darkness on that place so that they might know who I am. God shines light and he is presence in his presence is light. Not just the, the fo photos that we see or whatever. It's an understanding. It's a comprehension that if you were to be blind, you could still, still perceive and understand and comprehend the greatness and the goodness of God. And that's what he wants from him. But he says, I create because wherever he is, which is everywhere, there's light. He says, I create darkness. Why would God create darkness? darkness. And he goes on to say, and I cause calamity. Same thing. He's saying, I'm creating calamity. Why would God allow that to happen? Think of the places around the world where calamitous things are taking place, where darkness reigns, where light seems to not even be present, that, that people are, are, are cold to each other, worse than cold. They're, they're evil towards each other and we're evil. He, God, I believe, allows people to make decisions in their life because of where their heart resides anyway so that we can see him more clearly. It is easy to see God in the light of darkness and evil and want dis just craziness in this world. And to, we sang about Jesus earlier, about the character that we want to be, we want to see him, we want to feel his presence. Because what is the presence of Christ? It's all the goodness that, that God can sum up in his mind, that he manifests himself on earth as Emmanuel Christ, God with us. All, all those things, the logos of God that, that he, he, he created, and we saw that in Christ, the goodness of him. And yet some people want the dark. Some people prefer the dark. And God says, I will give you darkness 
so that you can see what light looks like. It's a great contrast to me. Here, here's a beautiful contrast. He says, I will create not just light and darkness. I will create well-being. And that word there is what? Shalom. I mean, that word shalom is deep. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a deep sense of well-being. It's, it's a deep sense of, of, of peace and of health and of, of security and of tranquility. He says, I will create shalom. I will create peace. And he said, and I will also create calamity, injury, hurt, moral deficiency. And so is he creating those? No, I look at it as God stepping back out of the situation and allowing the situation to take its head. Other places in Scripture tell us that. That he'll give you over to your own desires. That God will walk. And he was talking to Christians. He says, I will walk with you. I will be with you. I will, give you. I will gird you. I will give you an understanding of who I am. But when you decide to step back away from me, I will give yourself over. Because I love you. I care about you. And I, I, I don't want you to be in, in displeasure with God. He didn't want us to be displeasing him. So sometimes he allows contrast. To take place. Sometimes he steps back and his light, I think, becomes, uh, he, he creates from nothing. He creates that darkness that, and that calamity to allow the world to see. I mean, also going back to that Paris when we were there, I remember walking, we did prayer walking, and we were walking through some of the places in uh, Saint Denis, uh, some of the, the cheaper places where people could live that worked there in, you know, for the wealthier folks and they could live, have places to live. And there was black marks on the side of the apartments where we were walking by and they were raising cane and they were lighting fires, uh, not while we were there, this had already taken place, but they were burning fires and they were, they were protesting and they were resenting and they were just, it was just dark. And, and they, they, were, they were Muslims and I'm not beating up on Muslims this morning, but what I'm saying is that, 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 that they wanted change, they wanted it desperately, they wanted to know that, that, that a change could be made and they were rebelling and they were burning and they were agonizing and they were bringing pain calamity there was darkness in their hearts and they just didn't even know how to express it and so as that was going on we saw the aftermath of it and do we not in our lives see the aftermath of people that are kicking against god that are fighting against the light that he brings that are fighting against the peace that he wants you to have Oh, we see it all the time. We, we see, we see that, the outpouring. And then he finishes up again after saying that, that, that I can create these things. I can create darkness. I can create calamity. You have to understand, I love you so much. I want you to be able to see me clearly. And if I allow contrast to do it, I'll do it. And then he finishes up with, I am the Lord who does all these. So he's walked us through this. And he said who he is. He said our relationship with him is exclusive. He says what he does proactively for, for us. He girds, he creates, he causes. And then the results. The results of God interacting in our life are these things. Light, well-being, the absence of God, darkness, calamity. He says there, I am the Lord who causes or who does all these things because he's God. And because he loves you. And then he wants you to make a decision about that. If you acknowledge him with all that you are. What is that? The Shema. I love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you're going to acknowledge God. And you're going to love him truly. Then, and these are the things that who he is. Then what does he expect from you? His children. Who he is. Who you are. Who are you in Christ? Who are you as a follower of God? We use that term around here, pre-Christian, a lot. I like it. And, I, and I've always used it. I like the term pre-Christian because he wants that none should be lost and gives everybody the opportunity to follow after him and gives us no excuse for not. So who is he? Who are we? He says, I am exclusivity. I am the only God. And apart from me, you're nothing. And so do we have an exclusivity a thought process in our life that, that the God, that, that this God that we talk about, this God that we serve, this God that we come here and we raise our voices to, and this God that we pray to in, in our, our darkest moments, do, 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 we, do we believe that that's that it's effective? Do we believe in him or do we hedge our bets? 
I know when we lived overseas, they would, they would pray, and then they would go see the witch doctor. And it was really funny. They would all laugh about it, but they would do it. They would, they would pray, and they would go to God, but then they would hedge their bets, and they'd say, and to this guy over here. God's a jealous God. He's exclusive. And he asks you and I to be exclusive as well. What kind of a God do we serve that we say, God, I serve you, I love you today, and tomorrow I go to work and I serve work. And I serve the people down there. And I say, no, we serve as if serving God, he tells us in Scripture. We don't do it as in serving man. We do it because we love him and we care for him. And, and it says here, what does he do? He forms, he girds, he creates, he causes. What do we do in our life? What do we do? Are we just a good Christian and we believe in God and we do believe that praying to him means something? All, but we're not really going to do much about it. We're not really going to live a life that might, you know, require us to do a little self-sacrifice or, or do a little uh, really introspection to really view how we live our lives and what we truly believe and what, what, what that comes out in our behaviors and our actions, what we do. And the, 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 the last thing is the, those results. When, when God, what he does, when he creates, when he causes, it can be bad, it can be good. It can be light, darkness. It can be well-being. It can be calamity. He says, I do all these things. What are the results of your lives as a Christ follower? What are the results? What, what do you have that you can show as a result of your life as a Christ follower? What do you do? What does your day-to-day -day look like? So anybody would not, would, would not have a question as to who you believed in and what you believed and how you walked with him and how you wanted your life to reflect that light and that you step out of the darkness and, and you want well-being and peace, not just for yourself but everybody, and that you avoid calamity, bringing it and being a participant in it. What's the result of your life? How will people remember you? This is God saying, acknowledge me. Make decisions. Be proactive. Do we do that in our life? God's laying it out here very clearly as who he is. And if we are to be followers of God, he's giving you a roadmap right here of who you have to be. And it's our honor and it's our joy to follow after him because he is the only God. Besides him, there's no other. And he calls you into a loving relationship and asks you to participate in that. And then gives you opportunities to be the church, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We have opportunities at this church. We were talking about that earlier. We, we have opportunities to serve in many different ways. Marsha was talking about VBS. If you've never participated in VBS, join. If you've never been part of our pantry, if you've never been part of a committee in church, that has a bad, terrible connotation, doesn't it? A committee. Ah! You know, if, you're not, if you're not participating, though, how can you see the light of the Son of God if you will not open your eyes to Him? How can you be a participant in the love of God if He is not reflected in you? Thank you, Father. Thank you this day for coming to us in so many variable ways through the music, through the joy of, of seeing people that we haven't seen for a long time, through through hearing a, a message about who you are. God, our joy is in you. Our faith and our trust is in you. You care for us, and you tell us over and over, and you show us over and over in Scripture, and you, and you invite us to be in a personal relationship with you, and you give us opportunities to serve, like here in this church. So, Father, as we, as we close out today and as, as, as people take a moment to reflect on, on how they acknowledge you and, and the decisions that they make in their life, what, what, what those decisions mean, Father, I pray that you would spark something inside each and every one of us and let us live for you, but, but to act for you, to do things proactively for you and for your cause. Help us not just to be church in name, but church in action. Thank you, everybody, for being with me this morning and hearing my words. And, and I would ask you now, we're going to sing shortly, and I'd ask you to stand.
And as you stand, I'm going to be up here in front today, and I'm going to open this altar. If you just want to come up here and bend a knee and pray to God while we're singing, please do that. If you have a decision that you've made to be a Christ follower, if you want to be pre-Christian no longer and you want to follow Christ, I'm going to be right here, and I want to, I want to, I want to hear about that decision that you've made between you and God. If there's any other decision that you want to make today, any other way of acknowledging Him in all that you do, He'll make your path straight. He'll burden your heart. All I can do is ask you to act on what He gives you. Justin, if you would lead us in song, I'm just going to stand up here. If anybody wants to come forward, please do. Please do.
Yes.